We're especially gather, glad that all of you could gather here tonight and for us to have a stimulating conversation with Dr. Richard Sandor right after dinner. But I do want to introduce a few special guests, all of your special guests, but I especially want to recognize the fact that our regent, John Stewart, and his wife, Dee Dee, great supporters of the university, great supporters of this museum, have come over from Tulsa tonight to be with us. John, would you and Dee Dee stand and let us thank you for all that you do for the University of Oklahoma? I'm also glad that the uh, officers of our OU Student Association are here with us tonight. The president of our student body, Joe San Girardi, and Vice President Rainey Sewell are here. Will you two stand? And we're very glad to have you here tonight. We appreciate you being part of the festivities tonight. Uh, I just want to say, especially to our guests, that this has been a wonderful year for the University of Oklahoma. This, this year's freshman class, again, broke all records. It's the largest freshman class in the history of the university, and it adds to the academic rank of our student body, which is the highest rank student body in the history of the state academically, also with 100, over 190 new National Merit Scholars in the freshman class. We keep our ranking of number one in the nation among public universities in that regard. Also, last year, we hit the highest graduation rate, 68%, uh, of any university in the history of the state of Oklahoma, public or private. And as some of you may know, I don't know if you saw the announcement last week, we conferred 7,495 degrees last year, and this is a reflection of our retention rate, our graduation rates, that's the highest in the history of the state at any university. And we also passed the mark of one in four, starting at 2% 12 years ago, of our students studying abroad while they're here to one in four, and really, I think, spurred on by our new College of International Studies. Book clubs on campus, not for credit, just for academic stimulation, with faculty and students joining together, moved up from 60 last year to 70 this year, and so that kind of intellectual stimulation occurs across the campus. And I especially want to stop before we have dinner by just saying a word of thanks. Many of you in this room have helped in this regard. We launched a five-year, $250 million scholarship drive uh, uh, less than five years ago. We still have more than a year to go, and we've now crossed, thanks to you, the $206 million mark, which means we have more than doubled privately funded scholarships for our students. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And enjoy dinner together. We're very glad that all of you have joined us tonight. I will, will say that uh, you see uh, before you the cover of uh, Richard Sandor's new book, uh, Good Derivatives. And uh, in, in the course of the book, as he will to some degree tonight, discuss how market mechanisms can be used to further worthy social goals and uh, really is a fascinating discussion and his own creativity is amazing. As I told some of our students this afternoon, we're just all gonna have the pleasure to hear, enter into a conversation with Richard Sandor, especially during the question and answer period and that's something that Molly Bourne and I have had a chance to have these conversations with Richard and Ellen Sandor for now, I figured it up, over 32 years. And uh, it has been a joy in our lives. And, you know, I think all of us, if we're fortunate, have friends that after we're with them, we say to ourselves, you know, we're never, never together without learning something from them. And that's certainly been our experience, both of them. Uh, Ellen is a cutting edge artist and, and an expert in technology and digital technology in her own right. She's an extraordinary person. Both of them are very much identified with the University of Oklahoma. Ellen Sandor serves on the Board of Visitors of our Fred Jones Museum. She's very much at home in this room. She's very active uh, member of that board. Richard is on the board of the Board of Governors, uh, or Board of Advisors of the College of International Studies. They are not only involved in civic affairs in Chicago, they're very much involved in the life of the university, and we especially 
appreciate their generous support of this museum. Um, while Richard is known as one of the most innovative economists in this country, the two of them together are also recognized as among the nation's uh, most discerning uh, art collectors. In fact, Art and Antiques magazine uh, selected the top 100 art collections in the United States and included in that number the photography, the rare photography collection of Ellen and Richard Sandor. So they, they are, are really Renaissance people who are interested in virtually everything and it's a real, real pleasure to have them with us tonight. They gave the lead gift for our new photography gallery upstairs. They've generously given many photographs from their own collection uh, to the university and we're very, very grateful for their adopting Oklahoma as their, and the University of Oklahoma really as their second home. Um, they're very active in the Chicago Art Institute and other institutions in Chicago, as you would imagine. And I have to say, um, meeting Richard Sandor a few years ago, 32 years ago, was an experience in itself. It happened sort of by chance. Um, in my second year in the Senate, I became all of a sudden chairman of the subcommittee that oversees the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, there was only one problem with that. I knew absolutely nothing about commodity futures trading. I didn't know what a swap was. I didn't know what a hedge fund. I didn't know was. I didn't know what a commodities future was. And I had been named chairman of that. That's the usual Washington path. <laughs> Put someone who knows absolutely nothing in charge of a critical function and I was an example of it. And so there I was, chairman of the committee, and I'd been chairman of the subcommittee. I'd been chairman about a week when I was invited to go speak at Northwestern University and uh, to a conference on the regulation of commodity futures. <laughs> so I did what members of Congress always do. I assembled my staff. I had them dig been doing research for five or six days, and then I called them in just as I was getting ready to depart. You wait till you're out ready to depart and make the speech, because if you're briefed too far ahead and you don't know anything, you'll forget it before it comes time to give the speech. So they filled my, I go over it again, now what is a future? What, is, what does that mean? You know, what kind of trading mechanism here? And so they briefed me for two or three hours just before I got on the plane. They were briefing me all the way to the airport, putting these things into my head that I was just supposed to turn around and, and say in public, even though I didn't even necessarily know what all the words meant. So I arrive at this gathering, and the person with me comes over and whispers into my ear, uh, Dr. Sandor is in the front row. And I said, who is Dr. Sandor? <laughs> And they said, well, he's the chief economist, been the chief economist of the Board of Trade. He was a, an incredible economics professor at Berkeley, at Berkeley, and he is the inventor of financial futures. <laughs> so you can imagine, I am to speak to him about this subject, and he managed to keep a straight face uh, sitting in the audience. Thankfully, he didn't ask me any questions, I don't recall, and then he he kindly came up to me afterward and said, well, I know you're going back to Chicago to your hotel, and would you like a ride? And I thought, well, that's really nice. And, um, and, and I thought I might learn something along the way back. So he gave me a ride, and on the way back, he said, uh, would you like to stop by? He said, you know, we've we gotten into a discussion about art somehow. I changed the subject from futures to art very quickly. And, um, and he said, well, you might be interested in some of the things, you know, we collected. He said very modestly. So we stopped. He said, just come in for 30 minutes. And so we went in. I went in and turned the corner. And the first thing I saw was one of the two or three castings in the world of Rodin's Balzac. Uh, the other one I knew of was in the Metropolitan Museum. I realized this wasn't just your usual down-home art collection. And then we had a chance to tour and see the rest of it. And so it began a friendship between the four of us, and that friendship has continued. And every time we have a chance to get together, we end up staying up much later than we intended to because we get into arguments and discussions. And as I say, it's always exceptional 
stimulation that, that we receive from the Sandors. So tonight, I really um, am pleased to have him here and to put all you into the same position that I've been in so many times of entering into a dialogue with him, hear his creative mind at work. I mentioned that he is uh, known as the father of financial futures, um, and he will discuss some with us tonight how you come to invent new financial products. And this is part of the story he tells in his book, which he will inscribe for any of you afterwards who wish to, he will remain afterwards and, and inscribe books for you if any of you wish to acquire those books. He uh, started out as um, a professor, by the way. When he was 21 years old, he began teaching at the college level. Um, he had um, grown up in New York and Brooklyn, gone to Brooklyn College, part of the New York University system. And he... Uh, then went on to Minnesota to get his PhD in economics, then went on to teach at Berkeley. And while he was at Berkeley, he wrote an article speculating about what financial futures might look like, how creating a market that would give some protection against risks of shifting interest rates, how that might look. And people at the Board of Trade in Chicago paid attention to the articles he was writing as an academic, so they said, let's make him our chief economist, Let's make him vice chairman of the Board of Trade in Chicago, and that began a long association with both the Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where he's held very top positions over the years. He then went on, after this incredible career in the private sector, following his academic career, to found something called the Chicago Climate Exchange and the Chicago Climate Futures Exchange in 2004. The concept was this. We have pollution in our air. We have acid rain. We are facing all these problems. How can we use market mechanisms to best solve this problem? For example, so we had the concept of, of trading in emissions uh, improvements. So let's say you have two companies and you, you need to clear the air in a metropolitan area, let's say, and take so much out of the air, out of the atmosphere in terms of, uh, of carbon dioxide and the rest. One company could do this given its, its uh, position for, let's say, $200 million, or no, let's say $2 million. Another company could do it for $10 million, and you would get exactly the same number of emissions taken out of the atmosphere. Well, what if you could devise a market where the company that can do it for $2 million cleans up the air to that degree, and the company that would cost $10 million pays them, in essence, to take more emissions out of the atmosphere because they can do it more cheaply. So what have you done? Let's say if, if it's done for for uh, $40 million instead of $400 million, you've not only cleaned up the environment, but you've also created $60 million of capital and new economic resources because you've done it more cost effectively. And that's exactly the concept that he had. Let's clean up the atmosphere through the mechanisms that are most cost effective. This will create residual capital available for other things. And it will also create jobs for people using the technology that will be cleaning up the atmosphere. So using the market mechanism as opposed to just a straight government program or a government subsidy or other methods that might be used, using the market was more effective. It certainly created more wealth and it created more jobs in the country and had a huge environmental impact. That was his creative idea. And so, so began the Chicago Climate Futures Exchange and the Chicago Climate Exchange. The University of Oklahoma was one of the first universities in the United States to um, join the Chicago Climate Exchange. We also were the first university in Oklahoma to sign on to the Univer American University President's climate commitment. And I'm really pleased to tell you that earlier this month, we became only one of four organizations nationwide to be selected as a Green Power Partner of the Year by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So trying to become involved ourselves and using market mechanisms um, to promote environmental progress has been a goal of our university and, of course, 
in many ways, we were educated about these possibilities by Dr. Sandor and the Chicago Climate Exchange. He also formed the European Climate Exchange in 2005, which is Europe's leading exchange operating in the Economic Union Missions Trading Scheme and the benchmark for world carbon prices. It's been an exceptional response in Europe and an extremely successful one. So these innovative minds, this innovative mind that he has, operating to create new markets and to use these new market forces for good is really something to watch. This afternoon, he challenged our students to think about the kind of changes that were going on in the world around them that might create markets for products that we'd never thought about having a market for before. One of the things he mentioned, and he may have more to say about this tonight, was water as we look to the future. So he's saying to them, use your creative minds to create new markets which will be helpful to society and, of course, very financially beneficial to those who help start these markets and to the countries in which these markets reside. He's been honored by the city of Chicago for his contribution to the creation of financial futures, interest rate um, opportunities through market mechanisms that have saved millions of dollars of interest to public entities, the country, cities, and others. Time Magazine selected him as one of its heroes for the planet in 2003, named him the father of carbon trading in 2007. He has held academic positions at many institutions, as I say, starting out at age 21, teaching at the college level, including the Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern, and at the School of Businesses at the University of California, Berkeley, Stanford University, Columbia University, and he currently is teaching a class in both law and economics at the Law School of the University of Chicago. He is also a distinguished professor of environmental economics and finance at the School of Management at uh, Peking University, and his ideas have been extremely influential in China and are influential today and help shaping their approach toward environmental issues in that rapidly growing part of the world. So he is definitely one of the most creative and stimulating thinkers of our time, and it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Richard Sandor to you. Thank you, uh, President Boren. Uh, this Dr. Sandor sounds like an interesting guy. Maybe I could meet him one of these days. Uh, I'm humbled by the introduction. Um, I feel I am home, boomer sooner. Uh, and <laughs> it's just great to be here with all of you today to talk about a subject that's very, very dear to my heart. Um, I can't say enough, and I have to begin by um, David left out one important thing, that Ellen and I are territorial marshals of the state of Oklahoma, which, <laughs> and I consider that one of the most important accolades that we've achieved in spite of the others. Um, right now, finance ranks with the world's oldest profession in terms of social recognition. Uh, <laughs> you're not exactly greeted with open arms when you say, I'm a financier, um, or I invent financial products. Uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, former chairman, Paul Volcker, said the most important financial innovation in the 21st century was the ATM. <laughs> Not a nice thing. Um, Joseph Stiglitz, who won a Nobel Prize in economics, a leading commentator on many late night shows, said he doesn't know of one single derivative that's ever been of social use to anybody. So here you go, Joe. Um, <laughs> what is financial innovation? What does it mean? Uh, and let's talk a little bit about why it has this reputation. 
Uh, everybody in the room heard of uh, Henry Ford. Uh, anybody know who is, and I have to exclude all the people who were at this afternoon's talk, anybody who wasn't at the afternoon talk who knows who Luca Pacioli is? First, let me say he's not from the Godfather. <laughs> okay, he doesn't sleep with the fish. We do have one hand. Yes. Well, we call him the father of the balance sheet. Yes. <laughs> he, uh, he wrote a book called Summa De Arithmetica. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> In that book, he had a chapter that described the double entry bookkeeping methods of the Italian merchants. I, I have to say, I have spoken at uh, Berkeley, uh, I've talked at Yale, I've talked uh, at Ohio State, at Minnesota and I've talked at the Milken Institute, and I think that the first person who knew exactly who Luca was, so thank you. Here you go for all you. <clears throat> anyway, he's the father of accounting. I would humbly suggest that there's no comparison between the contribution Luca Pacioli made and Henry Ford. There would be no, it wouldn't have been no Renaissance without Luca Pacioli. No Medici's, no art, and no development of the Renaissance as we know it. Why do financial innovations get no regard? What is the story? How come? Number one, they tend to be wholesale products, okay? They're not Ford Motor Companies, they're not consumer. They're not like Polaroids, okay? They're not things that most people know about. Number two, they tend to be collaborative, more like film. And until the French came up with the notion of auteurs and then assigned the director as the auteur, films were not really classified as art because they were collaborative. And the third reason is they're generally not patentable. And so all of those result in financial innovation really not having a kind of role in the academic world and in the practical world. And so people who innovate don't generally read about Luca Pacioli. One of the big things that has happened is derivatives, okay? And the title of this book is well, what is a good derivative? And, and first of all, what's a derivative? When I was asked in 74 what were these financial futures I was working on, I said, I call them derivatives. And they said, why? And I said, because they are derived from something else. So there's corn, and then there's corn futures and corn options. So there's the price of corn today, and a derivative might be the price of corn during the harvest in December. So that's a derivative. What is a good derivative? It's one that's regulated, transparent, and it is traded on an exchange generally and doesn't have counterparty risks. So you have the exchange guaranteeing the validity of the trade. So in the Great Recession of 2008, we had grown from two exchanges, David in Chicago in 74, to 78 worldwide in 36 countries. Not one failure, not one ask for government money, not from Japan, not from China, not from India, not from Hungary, not from Poland, not from Russia. Every single exchange that was regulated and transparent required no bailout, unlike the banking system. No commercial bank, unlike the 80s in Oklahoma and Texas, went under because of interest rate risk. No SNLs failed. We lost 5,000 in the 80s. We lost 13,000 banks. All of them manage their risks, and that's what good derivatives do. What's a bad derivative? A bad derivative is one like Greek debt, what are called CDS, 
collateralized default swaps. That is, you can bet or buy insurance against the government of Greece defaulting. In 2005, that insurance cost 27 basis points. One quarter of 1% is what you could buy insurance against Greece defaulting. Kenneth Rogoff pointed out in a recent book, an economist at Harvard, this time it's different, that from its formation in 1829, Greek defaulted, Greece defaulted every other year. 50% of the times, not one quarter of 1% of the times. So you could buy or write insurance against Greeks defaulting, and you'd earn a quarter of 1%, and the person who bought the insurance had no margin, no guarantee, no price transparency, and CDSs brought down AIG and almost all of the banking systems. They were opaque. They were not margined, they had no credit guarantee, and they were mispriced. And that's what a bad derivative is. The good derivatives to shift back have grown dramatically. Since I got involved in the business in 69, they've grown at 18.3% per year, every year for 40 years compounded. I don't know of anything that's grown more than that, any industry. Okay, the growth has been remarkable. Remember, no failures, no bailouts, nothing like that. The market cap of the business, if you add this, just three exchanges in the United States, is in excess of $30 billion. Compare that to the US airlines, American United, and the top five, it's 24 billion. So the exchanges in the United States are roughly 50% bigger than the airline business in terms of market cap. Now, that's not a measure of what they do. What they do is they deal with risk transfer that is efficiently passing the price of corn risk, the price of interest rate risk, stock risk. All of them provide a vehicle to transfer risk. I don't know what that's worth. And we were having a discussion at dinner, and economists really don't know what it's worth, but somebody is at least has is, said 5 10% of the commodities in the United States, plus the financial instruments, that's what price insurance should be charged. So that's a big value. Now, price transparency, another value of good derivatives people don't talk about and and price discovery and by price discovery i mean the farmer in mississippi in oklahoma who decides who looks at the forward prices of soybeans and corn and decides which should i plant and that's an enormous value the People at the People's Republic in China who are looking at U.S. wheat prices next year and decide when, what they're going to import, that these are freely distributed, recognizable, and the farmer can never touch the market, but yet will be guided by the decisions that are being made in an open, transparent, regulated market, the kinds of oversight that President Boren had and the U.S. Ag Committee had over that and all other instruments. Remember, none of those failed. Now, the markets require two things. They require hedgers and they require speculators. And here's a dangerous tack, President Boren. Speculation is very important. Let me make a very important distinction between gambling and speculation, okay? <laughs> Which I think is very, very important. In gambling, there is no risk until you build a casino or a racetrack. The risk is manufactured for leisure time enjoyment. 
The price of soybeans go up or down and aren't manufactured risks. Interest rates go up or down and not manufacturers. The stocks of our companies in the United States go up or down and not manufactured. And some of the people who take those risks on, if they were in the venture capital period, they, they would be lauded. So for example, all of the speculators who took on the financial risk from Stephen Jobs and left him with the technological risk were speculators, right? The same with Facebook, the same with almost all technology that has been transformative. People took private equity, what they're called, or sometimes hedge funds, took on risks that inventors didn't want. And that's an important part of a dynamic free market society. Now, Franco didn't like it in Spain in the 30s. And so he had a solution to speculation. He sent a notice out that all of the speculators in Spain were offered a meeting with Franco personally in the Central Square to talk about what was going on with speculation. He got them all in the square and he had them murdered. And it worked. <laughs> the price of grain fell dramatically and everybody said he solved the problem. He murdered the speculators and, and, and he drove the prices of grain down. It worked, except the next year there was a short crop, the grain elevators were empty, there were no grain buffer stocks, speculative stocks carried from one year to the next and there was famine. So the important thing is that the speculative activity be done as rules-based, regulated, and looked over carefully by regulatory agencies and controlled and governed. Not eliminated, but regulated intelligently by the government. <clears throat> Let's talk about speculators are all present in today's grain market. We're going through a drought in the United States of America. We're near the highest corn and soybean prices. Anybody hear of famine as a result of any of this? Anybody hear of lack of supplies of food because of market conditions? In the no. The markets work very effectively. Someday, Maybe as we get closer to the election, somebody will turn on and say the speculators caused it. But right now, we're efficiently moving food to its highest and best use and to the best advantage of all of the farmers and ranchers in Oklahoma and all of the other people. And it's not, the grain's not being lost, it's being hedged, and they're making the most of it, and farmers will have a very good year in spite of the fact that the drought is there. Part of it is social cover, but part of it is risk transfer. Um, U.S. food prices have gone down from 25% of disposable income in the 70s to 12%. We spend the smallest proportion of the world on food for our people. We do it because the agricultural sector is efficient, Food flows to where it's needed. We have an infrastructure system that moves it from the, in the rivers internally through an export system, and we satisfy our needs. Transportation, okay? We might argue whether you like or don't like Southwest Airlines. It hedged American, sorry, David, um, United, bankrupt, okay? Different kind of culture. No, no risk management. So that's food. Let's take transportation. Housing, okay? The Ginny May market, in spite of the fact that it's not subprime and all of that occurred in the bad derivatives category, ended up not being regulated, not being traded centrally, bulked up and traded in a corner, and frankly encouraged by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and legislation. But aside from that, 
you used to pay a point or two points, and that was the spread for Ginny Mays when we started Ginny May Futures. It's now a 30-second. That one point of fees spread over 30 years saves the average American homeowner $6,000 in mortgages. So that's housing. The 10-year U.S. government, before there were futures, traded in an eighth to a quarter of a point. That was the difference between the wholesale and the retail price, right? Walmart helped to collapse that spread. The existence of futures helped collapse the spread between the buyer and seller, so the intermediaries lost out. That narrowing because, tragically, we'd issued $24 billion of 10-year debt every month of last year, compared to $24 billion when we started the futures from 1776 to 1982. So from 1776 to 1982, issuance in the 20 billion, last year 20 billion every month. A little frightening statistic. But that narrowing saved the U.S. taxpayers $500 million in interest rate costs. And pension funds who bought and sold and university endowment funds spent 10 billion dollars less in transaction costs than before the transparency existed. I could go on and talk about lots of others, but I want to talk about one other good derivative and talk about the social value of it, and that's the acid rain program that President Boren mentioned. The situation on the left was how the United States looked in the 80s. <clears throat> And the situation of how it looked is in 05, and it's down now from that. It's almost all pink. We've eliminated acid rain in the United States through trading of the type that President Boren described. Last year, it threw off $123 billion in reduced medical expenses associated with lung disease. And it cost the economy one to two billion. So the net savings was 121 billion. And every year, 32 to 40,000 people are alive and don't die of lung disease since this program and SO2 has been eliminated. The program has now been hobbled and cap and trade dismantled in the United States. The most successful program that we have ever had, and if you use cap and trade today, there's not any mention in any presidential party. Nobody talks about acid rain. In fact, it's the greatest successful environmental program, and it's held in low repute. Figure it out. Uh, <laughs> it's supposedly too difficult for people to understand. I think. David explained it in two sentences. Um, a fifth grade class in upstate New York teacher taught it to kids by giving them chewing gum permits. And each day, each week, they would have less permits and they traded the permits with each other. So a kid who didn't want to chew gum could sell his rights to chew to another kid. So she taught a fifth grade class about cap and trade. I can't do it in the Senate or the House. <laughs> I should come with chewing gum. <laughs> now, in spite of, of, of this, I want to talk in the last five minutes, and then we'll throw it in about some questions, and then we'll, we'll throw it out for some discussion. Um, my mentor was a man by the name of Ronald Coase, who wrote the uh, the book, and he talked about price and price signals and how they were important. And he also talked about the fact that economists before his research, and he won the Nobel Prize in economics, that we couldn't 
really deal with problems of the commons, common resources. And he argued that voluntary programs sometimes could set examples, and he wrote an article on lighthouses in the 19th century because Paul Samuelson, most leading economist, said nobody would build lighthouses because of all of the free riders, that the people who paid for it, and this wouldn't work. So he discovered in 19th century England there were for-profit voluntary groups that worked on lighthouses, and England led the world in building lighthouses, and there was no public requirement. I was inspired by him to start the Chicago Climate Exchange, which is a voluntary effort by individuals who took on a legal binding agreement to reduce their emissions of CO2 without law. Among them, OU, okay? But not only OU, everybody said to me, you're nuts, okay? You're not gonna get anybody to volunteer and get a contractual right to, to reduce emissions 6% without a federal law. And to the young people here, I, I, I think more than anything, um, I was accustomed, failure is your friend, okay? And change is an opportunity. And those two things have guided me for a long time. And so I had been ridiculed and thrown out of a lot of places when they said interest rates don't fluctuate. It's a stupid idea. Go back to Berkeley, you know, and be an adult. You know, we don't need to hedge. And I simply said that that's true. They didn't move between 45 and 70. It was something called Bretton Woods, and it prevented it. But I said, if you go back to the panic of 93, 18, if you go back to the Civil War, rates were volatile. So I set out after a paper that I delivered in 1992, and I sat on a beach in Rio de Janeiro drinking a caparina <laughs> and, and said, I think I know how to do this, and set off to do it and thought we could do it. So everybody said, nobody's going to sign up. And lo and behold, we ended up with 17% of the Dow Jones, 11% uh, of the Fortune Top 100, and 25% of the power companies, 16 million acres of farmers, millions of acres of forestry, all cooperating. Uh, IBM, Intel, DuPont, Ford, Honeywell, International Paper, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these guys reduced emissions by more than France, 400 million tons with no law and no demand to do that. So it can be done, and now let's talk about some of the lessons that we've learned, okay? And I'll uh, talk about the future, and then we'll open up into questions. All right, let's talk about what the new risks are. Where are the problems? Oklahoma, unfortunately, lives in the tornado part of the United States, or what people in the insurance call tornado alley. Most of the United States exists or lives, 70 to 80 percent of the population lives in high risk catastrophic areas. California for earthquakes, Texas all the way up to New York in the hurricane zone. So we have a $16 trillion economy. How much capital is there in the property casualty insurance sector to cover all of the catastrophic risks in the United States, all of the property risks, and all of the lives lost in that thing? Well, I'll tell you the answer because it's, it's, if it was a, a different kind of thing or a Socratic, we'd talk about it, but let me get to the final line. There's 550 billion. Hurricane Irene two years ago almost hit lower Manhattan. It would have wiped out the industry. Any single event, and then we're gonna worry, and I wanna ask you politically, do you think any state governor is gonna allow any homeowner not to get insurance proceeds after a national tragedy? The answer is no, right? 
So that will become the public opportunity. Instead of raising the amount of capital in your business, we are all collectively as taxpayers paying that in. What kind of behavior does that suggest? To the business students and people we've talked in, I would say, what's the best strategy? And talk about perverse incentives. We'll take Mr. Coker, Ms. Wong, we'll go out and we'll establish a risk company along in California. And we will walk our way up and down the San Andreas Fault and write as much insurance in the most dangerous part of Miami, California, Oklahoma, and we'll do it with 1 20th of the capital we need. And if it works, we'll build up enough capital. And if it doesn't work, we'll do what the bankers did and give the keys to the state government. Because there's no effective regulation and the government is establishing wrong-headed capital requirements. Thought process. Second food for thought. What's our reaction to bad derivatives? The US Constitution is six pages. The bill establishing the Federal Reserve Board is 25 pages. The bill that President Boren sat and had oversight for the, in the CFTC Modernization Act was 154 pages. The Acid Rain Act within the larger is 15 pages. Dodd-Frank at 2,300 pages is longer than the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the Koran combined. Now, explain to me how the religious precepts of, of three billion people can be covered, okay, in fewer pages than the amount of capital needed to keep the bank straight. <laughs> Something is wrong, okay? So, last food for thought, the rating agencies that we mentioned. Okay, everybody said that's the answer. So, if we were in a classroom, I'd say, how many companies in America are AAA? But I will recite the answers, there's four. How many countries in the world have AAA ratings? The answer, 14. How many securities did S&P and Moody's rank AAA from 2000 to 2008? 16,900. Now, I ask you, if I pay you to rate me, is that a good business model? Is that a problem or an opportunity? Okay, ask yourself that question. Let's talk about the next 40 years, okay, and what's gonna happen. I think we're gonna see a worldwide viewpoint. While we're going to command and control and heading socialistically, China, India, Vietnam, Mexico, Brazil, this past week, Thailand and Korea are all going to cap and trade and we're eliminating it from our, our thing. We will follow, not lead. The only hope is California which starts a model in 2013 and that we go back to federalism and start at the state level and build upward, okay? That's where we're good and I don't think we're gonna see anything at the federal level, but I'm optimistic because of the, of the help. So the United States and those countries there are all adopting emissions trading to deal with pollution, we're gonna follow. The biggest commodity, random thought too, the biggest commodity of the 21st century will be water, okay? And the biggest opportunity is to develop water markets. There's great interest in China, okay? There are some nascent ones in Colorado. 
We have a contract with the province of Alberta that will run out of water before it runs out of oil, okay? The scarce resource in the world is water, and there is no substitute. Not plastic for steel, not aluminum for steel. There's less than 1%, okay, drinkable in the world. 97% of the planet's water is seawater. Much of the fresh water is locked up in five lakes. Of 20% of the world's fresh water in the Great Lakes in the United States. We are long water. South America is long water. Europe is long water. Everybody else is short. I do believe Tibet is not about religion. I believe it's about water, okay? If you look at the headwaters of the rivers that feed India and China, look and ask yourself, is it religion or is it water that's driving the battle here? And I think a close examination might suggest that it's not a battle of religion. It's a political battle for the most important resource of the 21st century. What have I said? Okay, I've said that there are differences between good and bad derivatives, that the regulated kinds and organized exchanges perform flawlessly during seven and eight. That the models that we have there could be adapted to banking, to all of the bad actors, margining, transparency, capital requirements, oversight, regulation. It can be done competently. It was with commodity futures in 154 pages. It doesn't need 2,300 pages. There are some goodies in there we don't know about. And we don't know why they're in there and who's being served by them being in there. We've also said that these contribute a lot to an economy, and that, in fact, finance is very important. You need a well-oiled financial system to feed real production of goods and services. We've gone over the, the, the boundary line in empowering financial services, but there's an important role for them to play in economic development, that's recognized in China, in India, we still are the world's envious. We tend to react to crises, and I do believe that if we look at, at the errors, we look at insurance, some of the other potential problems, we look at the models that have worked, go up to Ottawa and see how the French regulate, uh, the French, the, English and, uh, and Canadians regulate their banking system. I was thinking of Quebec, Guillain. Um, look at what's worked, okay, and try to recognize that a lot of the solutions are local, not federal, that, that you are empowered. And most importantly to, to the faculty that are here and to some of the students that weren't here, derivatives are like hammers, okay? They can be used to crack somebody's skull, or they can be used to build houses. And financial services, and those of you, and particularly to the young people that are here, and if you are going into finance, please go build houses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. And, uh, now we're going to go up to questions, and I'd like for you to, just as we're getting ready to start this, to maybe elaborate a little more as you did this afternoon with some of our students about water. How much water is really needed by people to live and to survive? How much water are we really consuming in places like Albuquerque, New Mexico? You gave the example. Uh, and how can we use the mechanism of creating a new market for water internationally? I've always thought we had to have, we start with a market grid. So we move oil around the country, we move gas around the country. Why don't we have reservoirs and move water around the country from areas of surplus to areas of need, and then create a, a market, as you've created in other areas, 
for water pricing so that we make the most effective use of water, conserve it where it needs to be conserved, get it to where it needs to go. Uh, how can that work? Uh, let me uh, kind of draw the, the analogy that, uh, number one, uh, just paint some of the overview that we have. We need, all of us here, about 20 to 30 gallons a day for hygiene and for hydration, the average human being. I think that's essentially everybody's right on the planet, right? To the, all the water they need for drinking and for bathing, right? That's 20 to 30 gallons. The per capita consumption of water in Albuquerque is 175 gallons per person a day, down from 225. A toilet bowl is not meant to be used to, with, to throw out tissues which are soiled, right? That's five gallons of flush. A two-hour shower, okay, no, that's recreation. A five-minute shower, <laughs> a five-minute shower is hygiene, or 10 minutes, okay, or a bath, okay, isn't two hours, and I don't mind if some, as long as everybody gets their 30 gallons, I worry about the people who build golf courses in deserts, don't use cactuses and other kind of proper thing, have Kentucky bluegrass. It's fine if they do for it, they just should pay for it, okay? So you can trade any excess water over human needs, we should put a price on. And if we put a price on it, it will be allocated. And in the same way, we will build the infrastructure. We built wheat markets in Chicago. What happened here in Oklahoma? Wheat harvests came in, okay, hard red winter, came in, and there was no storage. The farmers had to sell into markets that were depressed because there was no storage. So all of a sudden, in Oklahoma, some entrepreneurs and some multinational grain companies decide, let's build storage so the farmer has a place to sell it and we don't have to dump it in the market when harvest comes in and it's either bought or sold. It's carried because it can be carried effectively because it can be hedged. So putting a price on something is the way to ration its use, right? And go to not to squander it. And it is particularly important, as President Bourne, for our common goods like water and air as for our private goods like wheat and cattle. And the same, very same tools under the same circumstances can you ration this scarce resort? We're rich in water. We have no infrastructure to ship it. We doesn't go to its highest and best use. It's sucked out of a river in Colorado. It's divided politically in five uses. The whole environment in the West is subject to a match. Okay, we are bleeding the source of the Colorado River and we have enormous environmental impacts as we take away these surface waters. And we don't know what the impact is. And we don't use it for valuable things. The alfalfa, as I said this morning, just to bring it in one example, $250,000 of alfalfa requires 650 acres of water one foot high. $250,000, and that's what is encouraged with subsidies. 650 acre feet of water throws off a payroll of $600 million at Albuquerque's Intel fabrication plant, and it employs 5,000 people. So it's one farmer and $250,000, or 5,000 workers at $600 million, and yet, the farmer can't sell the water rights to Intel. Everybody gets scared. Mark Twain said it, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, okay? And, and I'm not talking about the water that you drink. I'm not talking about the water that you use in your shower. I'm talking about 
that excess water over your fundamental human needs. That's what's traded. So it can be done. And in my opinion, and I think others, you go too much with this climate change, the first effects are gonna be desertification. Now what happens when two, 300 million people from South Asia get hungry? They can live with that for a day. Can they live without water? No. They go on the march. And we talked about, we had one of those late night evenings with Paul Kennedy here in Oklahoma. We talked about massive migration patterns. Water will generate it. People will go, they will get up because their babies have no water. Okay, and unless we, and right now in the Punjab in India, they're using their ground-based aquifers to grow rice that can't last. 500,000 Chinese kids under the age of five die of gastrointestinal problems. 25% of China is desert and growing. It's not reversible. Water is a very important thing, but we don't talk about the solution to that problem. I just mentioned as a historic footnote when he talked about uh, the creation of deserts by people and the particular importance of it now with the worldwide shortage of, of uh, water in those continents with the highest levels of population, that the very first book, considered perhaps the first book of environmentalism, was written at the University of Oklahoma by Paul B. Sears, published by the University of Oklahoma Press after the turn of the century. He then went on to form the Yale School of Forestry and to do other things with his life. But it's interesting that that historical footnote, that the first real book on that subject, Deserts on the March, was, was published here and down in the Natural History Museum on the wall in the rotunda are words from Paul B. Sears. So, he was prescient in a way that Dr. Sandor was prescient today in saying that we have to think about mechanisms that will, will use market mechanisms to make sure that water is used uh, according to its highest and most necessary uh, use. Questions? Anyone questions? Yes. Uh, I was wondering, given that map, uh, it, it's tough, but do you see any hope for a global cap and trade system probably after November, if not now? I do, uh, do I see hope for a, a worldwide system? And the answer is yes, but I don't think it will be designed from the top down. I never have and don't think so, and speak to it in the book. It will grow like cotton trade grew with a trading center in Mumbai, and then in Alexandria, Egypt, then in Winterthur, then in Liverpool, then in New Orleans. They will come to common standards, they will, respect each other and, and trade and have homogeneity between some of them. And that's what happened with gold, with cotton, with wheat. They all, nobody starts from this great super mechanism is they all came from the ground up. So I think air and water will be local solutions and then harmonization internationally after they've developed local solutions. That's one theory of the case. A lot of what you're talking about for the developing world, it seems, yeah, this seems very necessary. But like you said, it's not going to come from top down. But it seems to me that it requires a certain rule of law. It requires certain governmental infrastructure. How will that be provided in the third world, perhaps? It's a really great question. And I, and I do, one of the things we talk about talk about in the book is seven stages of market development, and one of it, them is unambiguous property rights and the rule of law, you know. And right now we see China having seven pilot programs in emissions trading. Remember, it's not on anybody's agenda in the United States. A guy from Guangdong, you know, which is like the Midwest of, of China, right? All of the manufacturing 
sat in a lecture at Yale uh, two weeks ago that I gave, and he was very happy to remind the 105 attendees at that lecture that Guangdong was already had uniform law and was already trading carbon. Not acceptable in Washington. Guangzhou, they love it. <laughs> Uh, you talk a lot about the need to create a market for the trading of water, but currently water is very much a public resource. There's not a whole lot of privatization, um, and you mentioned unambiguous property rights. How do you envision actually creating that for a commodity such as water? I don't think it's a big deal. Everybody, I mean, maybe because I'm just dumb. I like to look at that wall and then run straight forward and charge it and hit my head and then bounce off, assess the damage, and then go right back at the wall, okay? That, that's kind of the way I like to approach a problem. Um, and then the second time, reassess and head right back for that wall. Um, if we commoditized interest rates, everybody said you couldn't do that. There was no way you could turn interest rates into commodities. And people said, you no way you're gonna turn air into a commodity. Water is, you know, it's really a simple problem. You know, we know what potable water is. We know what not potable, dirty water is. We know what drinkable water is. The commodity is easy to define. We know who use that, uses it. We can give them use rights. We can make sure that the water, 30 gallons per capita, goes to every household and everybody else. And if a household in employs a dual flush toilet, one for solids and liquids, readily available, not at all in the West, five, two gallons versus five, and they use 35 and they're alloc or they use 20 and not 30, they could sell the water rights to an industry if they in and put in the proper shower caps and proper toilets, they could make money from efficiently using water. Similarly, the farmer that irrigates Maybe it's better going to a factory that creates jobs and the farm turn into a recreational facility and outdoors and preserve the environment that price, just like it created storage in Enid, Oklahoma and barges down the Mississippi and created, this is, as my wife said to me after, it is a field of dreams. Once you put a price out there, infrastructure gets built around it because people try to profit. The problem is no ownership, no responsibility, right? You don't abuse something you own, right? You don't wash a rental car, right? <laughs> We don't do that, right? Third payer problems create enormous problems. Third party payers, right? The company car, the rented car, we treat them differently than our living room, the airport lounge, right? We don't treat it because we don't own it. We got three problems and to all of the young people in the United States that are critical that open themselves to good derivatives. One is water, okay, along with clean air, okay, which still needs to be managed. The second is our health care system, where there is third-party payers, and the third is education. Those are all public goods and not priced and rationed in the right way. There are some people that have done it magnificently, like President Boren, And I don't say it because I'm a friend, okay? I'm saying it because I've been coming here and I watch the step of the students on campus and I watch buildings get put up in medical centers and we talk about cancer and diabetes and talk about Julius Caesar, you know, and, and, and the show that was just put on. There's a rationalization, it's not a stepping stone, you know, to another job, it's not a political, you know, task. It's something that creates real value. 
Yet the cost of education is getting really tight, okay? It's not good. I grew up and I wouldn't have achieved anything if I could have had to pay for the schooling I had. I just wouldn't have. Ellen and I both are the products of, of public education. And, you know, I, I just think I'm less worried about income equality uh, than I am equality of opportunity, okay? I want every kid from a small town in Oklahoma, Chicago, inner city to have a chance to get educated, okay? I don't think the incentives are aligned that, okay? We don't have proper incentives through K through 12, and the university system, in spite of it, we're the best of the world. It's getting tough out there. And I, President Boren knows it more than anybody. So I think those three areas of the commons really require attention and are ripe for financial innovation. Ripe for it. Before I call the next person, I have to give a commercial uh, <laughs> because of what he just said about education. One of the things that we looked at this last week, we had a conference at the state regents, and we looked at the fact that until we had the Land-Grant College Act, until it was signed into law during the Civil War, all, all of higher education in America was private. Small, expensive, elite, private colleges. And so we had a tiny percentage of our population obtaining college education. Then we had the creation of public higher education, and perhaps the opportunities in some ways peaked with the GI Bill, where we had this enormous fourfold increase after the war in the number of people going on. In the last, and it's, it's amazing, in the last um, 20 years in particular, we've been abolishing higher education, public higher education in this country. Public higher education is being abolished, and we're not even discussing it as a major issue. Why do I say that? Look at Oklahoma. Look at our own university. 30 years ago, more than half of our budget came from the state. Today in Norman, it's 14%. Our medical school is 6.8% of its budget comes from the state. Where does the gap come? How do we fill that gap between 50% and 14, for example? Well, we've done a remarkable job. We filled a third of it by increased private giving of our alumni and friends of this university. It's been remarkable and by increased earnings of our faculty through research and reimbursement for research overhead costs and the rest. Where did the other two-thirds get filled? Tuition and fees. And, and uh, what's happened as a result? Twelve years ago, we were first in the world in the percentage of college-age students going on to get higher education. Now we're 16th. We've fallen that fast in 12 years just, and it's almost traceable exactly to the decline in the percentage of our budgets coming from the state. We're still $90 million a year less for higher education in Oklahoma than we received in 2008. We at this university have absorbed $110 million over and above in cuts and unfunded costs over and above what we have raised tuition in the last four years. Now, so, and what are we debating about it? If we end public higher education in the country, we become full circle back to being a country with, in essence, all private schools, maybe some that get 2 or 3% from the state, but they're basically private, not public. And their costs are basically at the cost level of expensive private schools, not at the cost level of less expensive public universities that have built the greatest. We increased our productivity in this country. We doubled it in 28 years. Why? The GI Bill higher education for many, many more people, and now we're going full circle back the other direction, and we're not even talking about it. So I just put that in. I'm glad you mentioned education as one of these three commons. And um, uh, we'll go back to the question, but I decided to put that in because it alarms me. We're not even talking about it. The people in this country don't even realize that we're in the business as fast as we can, and it's not just Oklahoma. We are in the three worst states in the past three years in the percentage of support for public education being cut. We're in the three states that have cut the most. We're not even talking about it here, but it's a national problem, and it alarms me greatly. And when you think about, and you're exposed to all of the potential of all of these students, many of them first generation, it's, it's just something we have to face up to. There was a question back here. 
Yes. We'll just take one or two more questions, and then let me say that uh, Dr. Sandor will be back near that sign back that way near the near the stairwell, and he will be signing his books. And, and you, any of you that want to purchase a copy of his book, uh, there will be uh, an opportunity to do that as well when we finish. So let's just take one or two more quick questions, and we'll we'll uh, stop. Thank you. Um, in terms of creating a market for water, how would you prevent? Um, massive power centralization with that because markets often tend to allocate resources to those who can afford it, not necessarily to the best public needs. So how would you prevent such power centralization effectively with a market system like that? I'm not sure I, I understand the question, but let me fracture it in <clears throat> two ways. The economic profession has spent an awful lot of time in the United States and around the world, and, and for all practical purpose, the, the U.S. is the headquarters central for economics in the 21st century, in the 20th century. And much of it has been devoted to distribution. There are two parts of economics. One is how you allocate resources, to produce the biggest pie. We call that production economics, right? How do I get the biggest pie? And then distribution economics is how I divide the pie into different slices and give it out. Virtually all economics has missed the 60 to 70 million jobs that have been created by small businesses in the last 20 years, by the high-tech sector, by every technology, telecom, all of that. And the economics profession is focused on distribution, not on production, not on inventive activity, not on innovation. Um, and my teacher, Professor Coase, has been arguing this for some time, that we need more emphasis. So I think people have got to divorce the distribution question from the production. The first thing we need to know, and China knows this, they say, don't worry about distribution problems. I have to grow this economy at 8% a year to have political stability. I have 600 million rural poor, and unless I grow the GDP at 80%, I'm not gonna have a job as a politician. So don't talk about fairness. I'll talk about fairness, just show me how to grow 8% a year and give me the, the, the fishing rods to, to find the fish, give me the, the, the seeds to grow the agriculture, give me the means and knowledge to build my technological base. Then we will worry. So my response is not something specific, it's just to say, We've got to focus differently and understand the distribution question is separate from the production question. And the first thing we have to do is have a big enough economy to provide equality of opportunity for people. And, but we have to not use the production arena, okay? And that's why we have 2,300 pages in Dodd-Frank, okay? We needed, we had a problem, our banking system was failed and over leveraged. Okay, if President Boren and I sat down with three other people, we could write a bill in 10 pages. I don't know anybody who's read Dodd-Frank. I don't know what objectives and whose values are being preserved there. And what became a, a bill to supposedly reform the financial system I don't know, and nobody knows what it does yet. So, I, I, it, the market allocates where it does, and you need to make other questions separately, okay? You have to decide to fund the education separately. You don't tie up the means of production and try to mix it up with who's gonna get an education. First, get a hold of the the means of production, maximize the productivity of the economy, and then say, oh, by the way, X amount has to go for health care, Y amount for clean air, and Z for educational benefits. But 
you're not going to do it unless you make the pie big enough. There's going to be nothing. And we in the Western world have spent the last 20 years not worrying about how big the pie could be. We're arguing. And, and the result of that is you get, forgive me for the word, a kind of proto-fascism. Because people then get to do distribution based on their political influence. So now you get your slice of the pie depends on your proto-involvement in the political process. So we now get the distribution question tied up inequitably by a political system that's influenced by donations and other means. And I think a lot of it comes from the fact that we're not separating what is an engineering function, how do I build this bridge, from who gets to pass toll free, who gets to pay a toll, who needs to get to their place of business and shouldn't be charged for it. Instead, we try to dissolve and integrate the production and the distribution question, and the result is neither gets done. You don't optimize the pie or the distribution. I think I've spoken long enough. Can I just say to all of you, and I'm getting the hint from, from my leader, President Boren, it's really a fantastic pleasure to be here. Um, it is a great, great pleasure to have David and Molly as friends. Uh, I've done a lot of these things, partly because Molly got me on the board of a utility, partly because David, you know, introduced me to friends and joined, and so much of whatever small success we've had, we owe it to you, uh, Oklahoma, and thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before you all leave the room, I'm going to ask John Frazier, who's an industrial engineering uh, senior, to come up and lead us in the singing you owe you chant. Crimson Club member, who now that he's finishing up engineering, is going on to com combine it with law. And uh, we're pleased to have John lead us. If we'll all stand, and then I remind you, Dr. Sandor will be in the back. I think Catherine Bishop will lead him back, or someone back there will lead him back to the table where he will be. There she is. <laughs> and uh, we, he will be available to sign books back there. So, John? O-K-L-A-H-O-M-A, -A, our chant rolls on and on, thousands strong join heart and song in alma mater's praise, of campus beautiful by day and night, of colors proudly gleaming red and white neath a western sky oh use chant will never die live on university thank you all for joining us <laughs>